We did just hit a million views on YouTube. Yes. Can you believe that? James. Bam. James is the man. <laughs> yes. All right. Yes, he's making right. the magic happen. million views. That's yeah. pretty good. It's more than a million, but yeah, yeah. it's did quite we, Did we put that out on... Uh, that is a huge... Yeah, it's all James. Yep. It, it definitely is all James. Hey, good job, James. <laughs> Go leave him a comment uh, yeah. on any of the YouTube videos. Yeah, let congratulations, him, let him know how James. Much you appreciate yeah. it. Yes. Hey, and hit that subscribe button. On yep, there. subscribe. Yeah. When you do that, it just helps us get to uh, a larger audience for all of our educational materials. Yeah. And also, if you would be so kind as to leave us a Google review, we get lots of people saying how much they like our stuff or they like our equipment or right, right. You know, things like that. Whatever um, it is. Yeah. Let us know. We want to provide the content that you guys want. Uh, we think we're right. doing a good job. Right. Under no circumstances would we try not to do a good job. <laughs> True. <laughs> yes. Like, if we're not trying anymore, uh, yeah, you might as well just show uh, us the door. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but hey, look, we're in the middle of a GMP series. Yep. Um, this is a, a kind of a boring topic for a lot of people because it's not diamonds and sauce. Had to, yeah. It's not diamonds and sauce. It's not the hot topic of terpenes. You not know, right we're not now. Talking about the marketing pizzazz, not all right. that stuff. It's oh, you mean it's we actually have to? Stuff, we actually have to regulate this. Risk. We actually have to create a product that risk is assessment. safe and doesn't full of contaminants. That sucks. Okay. I know. Okay. Darn. It's not the wild west anymore, it's but that's good. West, yeah. Yeah. We don't want anybody getting sick out there. Yeah. Hey, look, the reason that all of these controls are in place is because analytical chemists are control freaks. <clears throat> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No, I but, are but, Okay, whatever. No, it's John's fine. The best. All good. It's the best. <laughs> but yeah, no, I know. I get what you're no, it's saying. Really, it's you got to control things. So yeah. I think that the, the wonderful thing that has happened in the GMP world over the many years is really just risk assessment. Yeah. And it is the fundamental thing. Why control it if there's no risk to product contamination or a safety or Affecting fire the production or anything like that? Whereas a lot of people were just in there measuring things randomly yes. for no reason you, with no risk assessment, which is the worst of money. Week. Yeah. Exactly. So forget about that. You got to get on with your risk assessment. It is the key process. And we, uh, a couple um, episodes ago, we talked, we spent an entire session on all the different ways that uh, methods that you could use so we talked about HACEP for a while we talked about oh, fmea yeah. Yeah. remember all those things oh we yeah talked about? we in actually went into the into the q uh into the q q7s and, yeah. and q, yeah. yeah we were all oh, in the yeah. ich and oh, the, yeah man, it's all the, good the alphabets yeah yeah <laughs> if there was an acronym we were talking about it so this is a uh, more on product processes and uh, product and processes and gmp fundamentals Really what we're talking about is providing you guys the resources that you need to make your GMP you know, production facility go yeah. with, uh, on without a hitch. Right. So you're going to build a facility, right? You're just going to get a design. You're going to build it. You're going to put all the equipment in it. And then you're going to get the quality assurance and quality paperwork. And then you're going to get audited, right? Wrong! Oh, it's not Don't that do simple? That. Oh, Don't do on. that. It's not that simple. You have to design according to a, a, a standard. And okay. then you have to make sure that you have design reviews. You need to make sure you have all of that, all of the items. in a part of the process is really understanding in your risk assessment, what's the critical factors, what are not the critical factors, what am I going to a measure, what am I not going to measure? Do your design review, and that impacts your facility, that impacts your equipment that impacts yeah. the arrangement of your equipment, how yeah. you operate. What we're doing here is really helping you guys try to understand, talking you through what are the issues that you need to be thinking of. And of course, we're open for business. Give us a call. Oh yeah. We totally. like to, we like to help you. If there's something that we can do or just gratis, we can do that. That's what all this educational material is about. Yeah. But if you want us to do some heavy lifting for you, we do a lot of work along those lines. I'm just helping people get ready you know, for GMP. Yeah. Get ready for GMP. It has a lot to do with the facility and the design reviews associated with that the process parameters. Right. You know, we're considered a subject matter expert totally. by a lot of the GMP consultants that are out there because they can use us to really guide the process through and and try to get you the information that you need to to get a good audit yep that in pass audit
Exactly. You, know? you don't want to have them coming out there and then. Oh, we don't have that like, documentation. No, no, you gotta, you we don't gotta, have any validation documentation on our solvent reuse uh, systems. They like probably that. didn't even oh, think of we it. We didn't even think about yeah, exactly. that. Oh, you mean we can't reuse our solvents forever? Uh, oh, my gosh. There's some oh, people out terrible. there claiming that they're doing that. Oh, I know. It scares me. It, yeah, it's bad. Uh, first of all, it's not GMP. It's very prone for cross-contamination. We're going to be getting into this right at the very end. In fact, right. it's a huge topic. It's talked about in both the regulations in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, there's guidance given in the U.S. for solvent reuse operations and also in, in Europe. If you actually follow those, you will find out very quickly, but that solvent based extraction processes are so freaking expensive. Yeah. You have got to be an absolute fool to, to, to <laughs> chase that rabbit down the hole. Yep. Here's the ICH uh, guidelines here that you can see in all their Q oh, yeah. glory. Q, Q1A. Q, Q, Q. Which one's your favorite? I Oh, Q10, that's the pharmaceutical quality system. That is what you are required to have. A lot of people ask, do you need uh, ISO or do you need pharmaceutical quality systems? Or what, what exactly do you need there? You need a quality system that will match the requirements that is in this Q10. Okay. Which is pretty awesome, right? They're giving it all to you. And then the life cycle management, which we're going to be talking about. Last session, we talked about process and product considerations. We talked about small pilot plants versus large production plants and the yep. need to have an increasing amount of GMPs as you go from, say, a microgram production all the way up to tens kilograms or thousands or, of kilograms, yeah. right? And uh, this chapter 19, which is really what we're talking about here, is uh, in the Q7, which is the GMP process that will allow you to establish a process so you can develop all the parameters that you need to go into full manufacturing and have all the rest of the real, all the rest of the GMPs that are in the other 19 chapters in, in the Q7. Okay. okay. And so we're talking about the process by which you would, and what the considerations are. We talked uh, quite a bit about choosing when your product was an API, right? Yeah. Is the product, is the biomass in the field an API? What does the Q7 have to say about that? Right. What's the difference between the guidance given in the Q7 Versus the guidance given in Europe, okay, yeah. for example, we talked about all of those. And also the key aspect of making sure however you define when your API starts, you have to do one thing, and that is get the data, right? Yeah. You have to have data that supports in a good scientific rationale for what you are trying to feed the inspectors. Right. And they're going to judge it. Scientific rationale, Very something important. along those lines. Very yeah. Important. So helps identify critical unit processes, critical units. So we went over this. And then we also talked about the life cycle stages, the process development. You got the idea of the molecule. You identify how to create it. And that's a process flow, essentially. Yep. You do a pilot process and then you do a process manufacturing. In this pilot process, which is the chapter 19, that's where you're really looking at understanding, hey, how am I going to... How am I going to make this happen at a larger scale? There's increasing amounts of GMP as you go in as the, the patients actually in the clinical trials, which you would operate under chapter 19 for clinical trials, which you're creating small amounts of materials. Yeah. As obviously, as you get more and more patients under your belt and you're feeding patients your API, you want to make sure that you have increasing levels of GMP, right? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Right? You, want you want to be prepared for scaling up. Yeah, exactly. So that's, making that's milligrams at a time for 10 years, I don't, it yeah, doesn't no, sound like a successful business. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. No. So mm -hmm. what's really cool though, is they made a way to, and they recognize there is a difference between just starting out and then full on production, right? Yeah. So yeah. makes it a little easier, right. some aspect. So we stopped this scientific rationale for applying GMPs to API. We mm -hmm. talked about that. And now we're going to talk more providing data for selecting critical unit operations, equipment parameters. And we're going to talk specifically about equipment and arrangement of equipment, what are the requirements for equipment, and then the control parameters that would asso be associated with that. And we'll see how far we get. Wow. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, there's oh, a lot of words there. Oh, forget about this slide. Uh, this man, is, no. we don't need to. <laughs> no, this is actually taken right out of the ICH for equipment considerations. And okay. I was thinking that we could go through this because these are really the requirements for the equipment. So yeah. if you have what's called a user URS or a user requirement specification document, these are the types of things that you need to have in there. And, um, a lot of times engineers will translate these requirements into like specifications, like the equipment shall be made of a stainless alloy that has been harvested from the third 
moon of Venus. <laughs> All right. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Like we can't meet it or we can meet it, right? Yeah. Something along those lines. Right. So let's talk about this design and construction equipment used in the manufacture of intermediates should be appropriate design and adequate size, suitably located for its intended use and cleaning sanitation where appropriate and maintenance. So what that's saying is that how you go about laying it out where it is, it has to be amenable to cleaning. It has to be, you have to be able to get around it yeah. so that it has, you can maintain it. Yep. Also notice it doesn't have anything here about fire clearances or it doesn't have anything no, in here about, about business considerations either. There are requirements that might show up in the user requirement specifications that have nothing to do with GMPs. Right. And that would be like fire requirements. This, you're going to put this into a, a fire classified room and it's required to have, say, one meter all the way around it or something along those lines. So in, in that case, you would have or offsets or distances and, and things like that. Or maybe there, there would be requirements specifically for that. So anyway, th that's what the URS would be, have all those different requirements in there. But you can see it's the appropriate design, adequate, suitably located for its intended use. So you wouldn't have, for example, a formulation reactor sitting next to your extractor. Oh, yeah, that's just bad placement. Because, yeah, it'd be bad placement because your extractor has dust associated with it, right? Yeah. And you wouldn't want to contaminate that dust into your formulation reactor, which right. is supposed to be super clean, right? You don't want to have... <laughs> so that's something that's got to be suitably located. It's intended use. What are you intending to use? We're taking going from biomass to, for example, oil. Yeah. Or you're going from oil to a distillate. Or you're going from distillate to a separated purified... Um, THC Excellent. or okay, CBD yeah. or yeah. any other uh, matrix even. The second one there, equipment should be constructed so the surfaces that contact raw materials do not alter the quality of the intermediates and the APIs beyond the official or established specifications. Now, there's a whole bunch of things that go into this. In other words, you can see that the surfaces that contact the raw materials, they're not additive or they do not alter the quality of it. So here's an example. So we want to make sure that the equipment is made out of stuff that's not going to add to or alter the quality of the API. That means there has to be a specification that would address the particular contaminant concern. Here's a good example. All the equipment shall be made out of three, 300 series stainless steel yep. because it, the concerns that if it's corroded or something, the corrosion byproducts then would get it into oh. the API and yep. contaminate it. Yeah. In the, case of, in the case of the extractor, in the intended use of the extractor, there's no corrosion that's present because there's no water. Yep. It's just uh, there's no corrosion. A lot of people will even specify certain types of stainless steel. They'll say it has to be a titanium or it has to be stainless steel or it has to be Hastelloy or it has to be it has to be 304 stainless steel only or 316 stainless steel only. Yep. The, the only reason that you would go about defining those particular types of metals is if you had exact process knowledge of a corrosion event that would come from the process that would happen during that if i have acid halides for example mm -hmm. and i'm using acid halides to extract my material halide would be like a chloro like hcl which would be you know, <laughs> hcl suppose i'm yep. using hcl acid in a dilute form and i'm going to use that uh, to extract whatever I'm extracting. All right. Yep, can in that otherwise. case, yeah, a 316 series stainless steel would not be a... Because that acid's going to eat it up. It would yeah. corrode it. And it then would actually, put it into the material. Put it into the material yeah. there, all right? So you would then specify in that case, uh, like a Hastelloy or a, or an alloy, then that would not be additive. Reactive okay. to that, yeah. Now, notice I, I knew the process. I knew what was in the process. I knew the chemicals that were in the process. And I made a, a determination based on corrosion knowledge and real actual knowledge that, yep. that 316 stainless steel or 300 series stainless steel was not appropriate for that process. Yep. And therefore, you couldn't use it. Yeah. So, then that, so that's on the basis of process knowledge. So let's now go to the extractor. For example, you shall not use 304 stainless steel versus 316 stainless steel. You now go back to the process. The process is, is non-additive. It's a non-polar solvent. There's no water involved. There's no corrosion processes that would be involved that would ever degrade either three fun, any 300 stainless steel series. Yep. So saying a one version of stainless steel over another would have no basis in scientific reality. Okay. It would just be what the engineer who previously worked on a case 
or a project knows about it thought was important in that case all uh, right yeah because he doesn't have that knowledge doesn't the, have the process knowledge and yeah. so they over specify right. or they any specification is going to cause you cause money right to flow yeah. out or whatever so it's important that that when a specification a specific thing is put down on paper that it has a scientific rational basis for the specification yep. otherwise you as the owner are going to pay more <laughs> that's yeah. it for nothing or nothing yep that doesn't help out uh, right any part of your process right so if someone came to us and said hey here's our user requirement specifications we need this uh, particular extractor or distillation unit made out of hastaway yeah we would be able to do that for you no problem at all but it would just cost you a lot <laughs> right. like we would say yeah no problem this is an uptick for hastaway the metals all this stuff it would take us another 15 weeks no problem all right if someone came back to us and said hey you need something made out of 316 stainless steel I said no problem that's our standard product here you go all right you know what i mean if someone came to us and said hey we can't have any 304 any in the contact surfaces on 304 there we don't have that with our products but there's no reason why it wouldn't be allowed with the intended use of the product so you got to have there's the intended use there's the intended process there's the chemical there's the chemical disposition mm -hmm. and the chemical assessment there's the engineering material that goes with the chemical assessment, and then there's the URS. Man. You can see how that all comes down. It's going to go together. you yeah. got to know your stuff, in other yeah. words, right? And that's how it all goes down. So having the point here is mm. creating specifications needs to have a chemical basis and a knowledge of the process that you're being. If you just have some guy out there winging it out because that's <laughs> what he did in the last three projects, yeah. you are over-specifying your product, your project. Yep. This is also important for things like additive processes. So suppose you have a, a seal material, right? Mm. And sometimes those seal materials will, if you have a solvent in there, it will leach what's in that seal material oh. into your process. So you, sometimes you don't want it. Like phthalates are a good example. Phthalates are in elastomeric materials, and sometimes those come out, out into your process. So that would be considered a contamination, okay? All right. You would need in your risk assessment to understand what that contamination is, mm -hmm. if it's certified, if it's been studied, and if it, it had, if you have a good basis on. for anything. If if it, uh, they have a whole series of regulations in the U.S., for example, called food contact regulations, where you wouldn't want to have this polymer in contact with food. It makes sense. So if you have a really fatty food, you wouldn't want to have a lot of phthalates in contact with your food because the phthalates would go into your food. Yeah. But if you have the plastic and it's in contact with dry goods, there's no risk really of the phthalates going into the dry goods. You know what I mean? So, so it just there, depends no, on it, Yeah, use. it would depend on the intended use of oh, the product right, and the intended use. So. It's a lot to take into account. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The chemists Man. make living, uh, like a living <laughs> off of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, we just specify. Yep. We don't, phthalates are not just generally uh, considered to be a good thing to have in your food and your food products. And of course, your rubber and things like that. Same thing with like lubricants and process lubricants. Process lubricants are there everywhere. If you have a pump, you have a process lubricant. If you have, there's things, if you have vacuum, here's yeah, the, the dirty little secret about the vacuum is anything that's in the pu vacuum pump that's uh, va that's oil it's actually back diffusing into your product uh, really and, yeah oh, it is oh, yeah okay. absolutely yeah. and in fact chemists can actually see that stuff uh, specific oh. types of chemists not organic chemists but analytical <laughs> chemists of course You're really just digging at those organic chemists guys. could never never see that but certainly analytical chemists could they'd be able to see all that stuff and yeah so th there's some things so if you don't have that identified as a potential contaminant yep. in your that's by the way that's why we use maintenance free oil free pumps yeah people wonder why you're using that pump it costs you three times as much because well, it's clean. A, Everybody oh, else using four hundred dollar pumps. We're using like literally four or five thousand dollar pumps, yeah. six thousand dollar pumps. Why? Because I know that back diffusion occurs. Yeah, diffusion occurs. The random walk occurs. It's a fact <laughs> of life. I like that. That Brownian motion backward. <laughs> Brownian motion. <laughs> Back in there, you can see it. Like. It, it, what happens is here's the oil over here, and then here's the process, and there's a vacuum in between, and the oil de desorbs, it goes into the atmosphere. It's, ah, I have to go over there. And the, <laughs> it's the, and then it goes over there. That's what happens. It's called yeah. chemical potential. Oh, and yeah. so that's what that is. It's just, like, um, just like taking a ball, putting it at the top of the hill. Here you have gravitational potential energy translating into actual kinetic energy. Yeah. bringing the ball 
into rotational energy down to the bottom <laughs> where it meets its potential where it can't go anymore. So that is the same thing. It will go. Anyway, I digress. Oh, this is going to take us a long time to get through this paragraph. Oh my word. <laughs> oh my word. Yeah. Production equipment should only be used within its qualified or uh, uh, established specifications. Yeah, this is a good example. You don't want to, for example, usually equipment, all equipment, pretty much that's out on the market, unless it's coming from somebody is used within certain specifications. Just recently, I know there was a huge explosion that was for like like ethanol extractor oh, I mean, yeah. a lot of people a couple of people died it was from a major manufacturer uh, not good it's in that's one of the things that you got to be careful with with your processes right yeah exactly yeah Something that, that's the second major explosion with ethanol extractors actually in, uh, the, in the california uh, area and the last time uh, fire firefighters died uh, yeah so that was not that not good yeah. Not good. But anyway, the, this is some, some things that you need to, you have to have established specifications when you're testing, also when you're using, you know, you're using it and you're testing it. And basically production equipment should only be used within its qualified operating range. Oh, notice it says qualified operating range right here. Qualified. So just okay. because something Oops. can do oh, something here. doesn't mean it's intended well, yeah. to Look, do Look, if that. I, yeah, if I went and I qualified the instrument, so I got a piece of equipment and I said this instrument is qualified to work up to 2000 PSI and it's qualified to work in an environment that's from say 25 or 20, 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. Yep. And then I stick it outside and it's about, it's getting up to say 30 degrees Celsius and I decide to run it out at maybe 4,000 PSI or 5,000 PSI. Now okay. I'm running it outside of the qualified and the qualification is actually something that the quality unit within an organization qualifies the equipment says, Hey, this is, these are the parameters under which you, you, you are operating and you can run it. So I don't, I wouldn't be allowed as a operator to go out there and, you know, start to start. Start. <laughs> Yeah, I'm using my own parameters, man. <laughs> I'm making are, stuff up. No, yeah, no, like, we don't use my own parameters. I got the secret sauce coming out yeah, of there. I want to do a little we'll, bit. Yeah. I'll leave that for the R and D guys. That's why we put process controls on our equipment. Yeah. So if you're a supervisor or you are a quality uh, person, mm -hmm. you can basically control, you know, what happens. What they're doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Doing. We, we've had a, more than a few operators try to call up and get our uh, get the operating manuals yeah, um, because yeah. I think they want to experiment on that. Yeah, they want to experiment, so, which is fine if they're doing that, if, they're, if their job is to experiment. But right. if their job is not to experiment... And just to run the stuff, then yeah. whatever. So yeah, yep. that happens. Five one one, five one two. Major equipment and permanently installed processing lines used during production of an intermediate should be appropriately identified. That's good. In other words, you got to have an identification. So you start off first with a drawing. The drawing will arrange all of your material, all, all of your equipment, yep. along with all your process piping, along with all the process utilities. And it will have it on a drawing in a nice drawing package. We create those packages for yeah. you. That's what we do. And it's and usually they're 40, 50 pages long. And yeah, it's not depending just a, on the operation. No, it's not just a rough <laughs> sketch. We typically start with a rough sketch. We we talk about level levels control, what the basis of design is. We talk yeah. about where the layout is, what the walls are, what the fire ratings are, all that stuff is in there, placards. Yeah. And then we also talk about all where all the utilities are. Yep. What else do we got? We got all kinds of things. Oh, yeah. And then, and then specific layouts for everything, critical process dimensions and all of that. Yeah. Like you said, the lining, not just yeah. the machines, the lines, everything. All so, that stuff. Yeah. Major equipment forward. and permanently installed processing lines used during the production shall be appropriately identified. That means specifically they have to be, they have to have labels on them. Equipment one, equipment two. Process okay. piping one, process piping two, yeah. that type of thing. Every fitting has a number associated with it. Any substances associated with the operational equipment, such as lubricants, heating fluids, should not contact the intermediates or the APIs so as to alter the quality of the APIs. Beyond the official or other established specifications, any deviations from this practice should be evaluated to ensure there are no detrimental effects on the materials fitness to use wherever possible. Food grade lubricants and oils should be used. So. Now they're saying, hey, look, once again, lubricants and uh, process, process polymers and things like that could have an impact on the established specifications. No, notice also it's saying established specifications. Right. So if I have no spec for, for example, solvent contaminants, yep. then, it ma then it always passes, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, technically. If I can't measure, if I can't measure the contaminant, 
is it really there? Yeah, that's a problem. I know yeah. a lot of people are using refrigerants these days to do yeah. extractions. And the R134, that's a chlorofluorocarbon. Yep. They're very difficult to, to measure. In fact, analytical chemists have a very difficult time measuring those. You have to have yeah. maybe an ESD or something like that to, to see that. And also the limits of detection are not so hot. So you get entrained process gases, essentially, that are entrained in there. You, you like. You extract with butane, you have to purge it, right? Yeah. Well, that's what happens yeah. with the fluorocarbons as well, or the fluorocarbons or whatever. And then you're like, you, no one can measure it. Yeah. See, no one's even looking at it as a contaminant. So it's always clean. Isn't that a beautiful? Right. Isn't that right. wonderful how that works? Oh, it's always man. clean. Always clean. No problem. <laughs> There's never a contaminant in here because you're never measuring what it is, and it's not in the specifications. So when you do your risk assessment, you need to look at the solvents that you're using. And you need to look at the process that you have along with the, all the, what the contact materials are. And you're going to say, oh, this is important. This has got a risk here. We need to know how to measure it. Oh, we can't measure it. Whatever. Exactly. We just, you'd want to be able to measure it. We, we, we might actually look for a different workflow, for example, or have a different solvent or try a different lubricant or try a different, we can only have, we can only have, for example, peroxide cured materials instead of like sulfur cured materials or something like that. This things that you can do from a, a chemical standpoint, from a processing standpoint, material selection standpoint, all those things really help. But it is saying, hey, look, it's admitting, hey, look, food grade lubricants are there. Now these, these simple lines and simple sentences take on excruciatingly large number of specifications. Yeah, you know when, I mean? you, like, when you put it all together, again, all yeah, the different fittings like, where stuff is... Yeah, nothing shall contact. be nothing that contacts the API shall be additive and change the specification. You yeah. know, you can see how that goes. That goes to the specifications of all the contact materials. That goes to the specifications of like, all the process stuff. Yeah, all yeah. The, even the process fluids, all that jazz. Yeah. Closed containers or should closed containers and contain equipment should be used whenever possible. That's because the open containers have risk contamination I from the, the dust. Yeah, anything dust that might be in the air, air or just anything in the air. You, you don't want a bunch of dust in your products, which is interesting in a little bit of respect because you're talking about like with hemp or with marijuana, you're talking about outdoor grown or you know, right. I mean, throwing on want, a tarp in the back. We don't want dust to, to we don't want dust in that. We can't have dust in that because <laughs> it's gonna you know, I understand it, don't get me wrong, but right. still there's something there that's humans from the beginning of time have mm-hmm. been smoking this literally smoking it and then you have have you ever heard of like uh, a product that you smoke that doesn't have contaminants in it of course it has contaminants cigarettes cigarettes have yeah, contaminated I mean, yeah. of course they're dusty you know oh, it's what? cured it guarantee the federal government guarantees that there's less than 0.0001 percent rat feces in there that's it yeah oh. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. I mean, it's a good ever a little bit of, but yeah, I understand yeah. from a standpoint of if you can control it, you should. Yeah, and if you can put it into a closed container versus an open container, it's better because you're, it's closed, right? Yeah. And then uh, a current set of drawings should be maintained for equipment and critical installations. This is what I was just talking about with the instrumentation and utility oh, systems yeah. and things like that. So. These are the requirements. Pretty interesting, huh? Yeah, there's a lot going on there. A lot and, of stuff going on. Oh, man, it's intimidating. Yeah. But, but it's a good thing that we make it easy for a lot of people. Yeah, if you need help navigating all these things, navigating how your equipment really fits with your process, understanding what's critical uh, equipment, what's not critical equipment. Not all the equipment in your, in your process flow will be critical. Right. Not all of the steps in your process will be critical. Just like we've been saying all along, you have to go through the risk assessment. You have to have yep. an expert in the process. You actually have to know the process. So the reason I'm bringing this up in the context of development now is because these are things that you need to be thinking about when you're developing your process, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're the, re- they're the requirement thing. So this is a key consideration for those of you who are in the process of developing an API and are, are following that chapter 19 in the Q7 that says, hey, we're going to make some small amounts. And then as we develop a process and as we specify our equipment and for scale up or whatever, yep. these are the things that you need to take into account. We have gone through this paragraph <laughs> and we've deconstructed it right online, Yeah, giving you all of our comments. I hope they were helpful for you guys. And of course, if you guys need any help with any kind of layout, design, uh, drawings, uh, utility systems, instrumentation systems, P&IDs, all that stuff, we do that. That's like, we do that. <laughs> all right, right, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and thanks for joining us and take care. See you later. Bye.